This is Mrs. O'Neill for AP Chemistry, Chapter 7.5, something I had to put in for the new curriculum for AP Chemistry a few years ago. So your objective is to translate this PES data and what it means about the electron configuration and location of an element on the periodic table. We also want to quantitatively have a relationship between the mass spectrum and the masses of those isotopes. So really there's two different spectrums we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the PES and the mass spectroscopy. So you should have watched that intro lesson on, again, Coulomb's Law. We should have already done a poggle on Coulomb's Law, so you should have some um, knowledge, uh, background knowledge on Coulomb's Law. So I'm going to go through these slides um, rather quickly, but here are my notes. So he talked about helium being a simple atom. Again, if you need to pause and reread this stuff, that uh, feel free to do so. He talked about why Coulomb's Law is so important. He talked about ionization energy and what that really means and what that really means to this PES. Gave you a nice flow chart as he always does. And again, there's Mr. Coulomb and who he is. So he has this torsion balance and then he dealt with these spheres. So here's two spheres. Here's like spheres, what happens to them. Here's a third sphere and what goes on there. And of course, on and on and on. So he kind of gave you different um, uh, situations. So why, again, is this Coulomb's Law really important? Well, of course, it's based off of ionization energy. So again, what happens when we take uh, that hand and pull away an electron? And again, what's going on here as far as the electron and ionization energy? So lithium then is a much larger atom uh, because now we have two energy levels. So we have two core electrons and we have one valence electron in an outer, uh, in an outer energy level. So again, what's happening there is the distance. Again, we talked about the attraction, the charge, and the distance is going to play a big part in Coulomb's Law. So again, what does that mean for ionization energy? And now he relates it to that photoelectric effect, which really came from Einstein. So he also went to that FET dot colorado dot edu website um, if you haven't seen this already he uses this website a lot um, it's really good for simulation labs so and we might uh, also use some as well so if you get a chance go and build your atom so he related that to the photoelectric effect so what does that mean for pes again here is our uh, experiment and what's going on so then he talked about hydrogen, and this is what's really going to be important, this graph. This is the graph that you're going to see on the AP exam. And what does it tell us and what does it mean? So there's a couple of things to think about. First of all, the number of electrons. There's that peak, and how many electrons are in that peak? There's only one peak because hydrogen only has one energy level. So the amount of peaks are going to tell us how many energy levels or sublevels, and the size of that peak is going to tell us how many electrons are in there. Now another thing to notice that's going to be really important is down here is energy. So sometimes the energy goes from zero and increases, but most of the time, and I'm going to show you in a minute, most of the time the energy here is quite large and it goes to zero. It actually decreases. Something in a graph that you haven't seen too much before, so we want to keep that into consideration. So the next is helium. And the neat thing is that he shows you both of them side by side. So a couple of things to think about. Both elements have one, elect uh, one peak that shows the one energy level, but one peak is larger than the other. Why? Well, there's one electron here for hydrogen versus two electrons here for helium. Now notice, again, the energy for helium to take those electrons away are, is going to be much greater than taking away the electrons for hydrogen. So again, the, 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 the energy is going from increasing, but most of the time it's decreasing. Then he added lithium. Well, what do you see here? Now you see two peaks for lithium. You see a big peak for the two electrons on the first energy level, and then a smaller peak for the one electron on the outermost. So this hopefully makes sense. It takes a heck of a lot of more energy to remove those two inside electrons than it does for that one valence electrons on the outside. And that's why lithium 
lithium is very very reactive right it has that one valence electron and it doesn't have much energy it does not take much energy at all to remove that one that one valence electron versus look how big of a gap this is 0.5 to 6.3 um, to remove those other inside ones so again this is what I was talking about most of the time the energy on the x-axis is reversed it usually is filled up like an electron configuration order just like that worksheet that you should have done so this I kind of count as the nucleus and as I go this way I'm counting my peaks like normally how I would fill the electron configuration and it should make sense because the closer you are to the nucleus the more energy is needed to remove those electrons so again, you should have done that worksheet if you didn't do it already. You might want to pause and do it now or after you're done with this video. So onto your notes packet. Again, read as you write. Pause, fill in those, those blanks, and then play to hear my words. So this is just telling you the PES and the method is used and why it is used and how it is used and what's going on. But again, this is just to give you that background knowledge as to how they even get that graph that we're really interested in. So the graph is really what's important. The graph tells us the electron count and how much energy is needed to remove those electrons. We want to remember that the energy is usually on the x-axis, is usually in the opposite direction. It starts out large and then decreases. We want to remember that those peaks correspond to the amount of electrons and to those subshells, uh, or I call those energy levels, right? Or the S and the P subshells, the shapes. The peaks with the lowest energy obviously corresponds to the valence electrons and the highest energy corresponds to those core electrons. So we want to remember that as well. It's going to be really important to locate um, the, 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 the lower energy versus the higher letter, uh, energy on that graph. So again, this is the device that is used, just that same picture, just a little bit bigger if you want to kind of take a look at that and what's going on. So let's look at these practice problems that are in your notes packet. So number one. First of all, let's look at the energy. Energy is going from big to little, good. So it's in the order of the electron configuration. Second, let's look at the peaks. Well, I have more than one, which is good because now I can compare them. Since A and B are the same, this is definitely two electrons because that's going to be the 1s2 subshell which means this B must be the 2s2 subshell, which means C, letter C, obviously has two electrons, so that's going to be the 2p um, electrons, okay? So hopefully that makes sense. Think about that electron configuration and how you fill it up, and this should also make sense. We have two valence electrons on the first energy level, and we have four, um, I'm sorry, these are core electrons, two core electrons and four valence electrons, okay? Um, and these, the energy here is closer together than this, right? Real far apart between energy levels. So let's count up those electrons, two plus two plus two equals six. The atomic number is six. So who on the periodic table is atomic number six? Hopefully you have carbon. So this should all make sense. We have six total valence, six total electrons, I'm sorry, I'm talking too fast. Six total electrons, equals the atomic number and if we look at our graph we have um, four valence electrons total carbon is in group 14 that also has four valence electrons so can we do the same thing here again large energy small energy we have two peaks that are exactly the same height so this definitely will be the 1s2 and now this will be the 2s2 now you have to decide here on letter three how many electrons are here well i'm going to say it's basically twice the amount so i'm going to say it has twice the amount of electrons so it's going to say 2p4 so 2 plus 2 plus 4 is 8 so our atomic number is 8 that's the total electrons or we have have six valence electrons so it better be in group 16 and that would be oop, and that would be oxygen okay number three can you figure this out on your own pause the video and come up with an element hopefully this makes sense we got the 1s2 we got the 2s2 I'm gonna say that's 2p5 right it really didn't triple in size we really just added only one so if we add up all those electrons we get nine or we have seven valence and I'm gonna say that this is fluorine now number four this might look a little goofy because it was kind of hard to cut and paste but again label using your electron configuration and then come up with an element did you come up with Hopefully neon makes sense.
Now, all four of those were in the same period. So now I wanted to look at these side by side. A couple of things, two things really. Um, the energy for that first electron or that first peak, hmm, or for the 1s2 um, orbital, look at where they are. So we want to remember this was what? This is almost 300, almost 600, 700, and look at this. This is almost 900. So we want to remember that the amount of energy for the first, the, the 1s2 uh, energy level or orbital, whatever you want to call that, uh, increases as we go across the period, right? Which should make sense. It's going to take a lot more energy to remove neons inside uh, electrons uh, than it is for um, carbon, let's say. The next thing I want you to notice is peak C. So again, as we're going across the periodic table um, or across the period on the periodic table, that peak also increases because you're increasing the amount of electrons. Okay, so can you finish up five? And I believe there's also six. So again, do your electron configuration and come up with an element. This time I just gave you sodium, so hopefully you came up with 11 electrons. And for six, Hopefully you came up with 13 electrons and came up with aluminum. So again, just real quick, let's look at them. They come from the same period. Look at your A, sodium is almost 1200, and here for aluminum it's almost 1600 for those inside uh, electrons on that first energy level. Um, and again, some other things to look at, right? You have your B, C, and D, and of course you're going to add your E there for aluminum. So what is up with this? Hmm. Pause the video and see what am I trying to get you to understand here. Hopefully this makes sense. They're both actually nitrogen. Look at the two different graphs, but they have the same number of electrons. If you add up the electrons and do the electron configuration, they're both nitrogen, okay? Even though the graphs look so much different, right? Because this one has a short space here, and this one starts with a thousand, and this is a really, really a long space. Um, so it doesn't really matter. You're just counting up those electrons. Okay, on to mass spectroscopy. You should have watched that video, and here are some of my notes. So again, I'm going to go through this rather quickly. Um, uh, there is a book question that we're going to be doing uh, in class. So again, this is just another uh, experiment or another device to help us understand these isotopes, right? Again, John Dalton, what he came up with, um, but we had to change some of that because of isotopes. Again, a nice little flow chart, the mass spectrometer, and what uh, it has three main parts to it called one part is called the ionizer and what that does the mass analyzer again that's the important part because that gives us the mass of those different isotopes and how many there are and of course the detector is going to kind of spit out some kind of graph or information for us so again it needs to be calibrated this is what's important again these samples so if you want to pause the video and make sure you're understanding um, what the graph is telling us but we will look at some more later so again, how would you figure out the average atomic mass? You did this in Chem 1, but maybe review this because I have seen some questions on the AP exam, especially your multiple choice questions on how to come up with the average atomic mass using this graph. So again, how many atoms um, are in the uh, 35 mass and how many atoms have a 37 mass? And again, um, figuring out the average atomic mass for all those isotopes for chlorine. So again, uh, you could do this with atoms or you can also do this with molecules and I will see you in class.